Hello, Best Darn Diddly listeners. It's Mike Reese, writer and producer of The Simpsons and author of the upcoming book, Springfield Confidential, Jokes, Secrets, and Outright Lies from a Lifetime of Writing for The Simpsons. Day Street Books and I are partnering with the Best Darn Diddly Review Show to give away five early release copies of my new book. All you have to do to enter to win is to use the hashtag Worst contest ever on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. You can also pre-order the book now on Amazon.com. Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Best Darn Diddly Review Show. This is a weekly podcast for anyone who loves The Simpsons, or ever has loved The Simpsons, hosted by two dudes that grew up on The Simpsons. My name is Miles, better known as Mr. Most Days Off, And today, we have another excellent episode to talk about, and we've got an excellent guest, so we're going to jump right into things. And first, let me introduce to you, your co-host with the most, Richie the Whiz Kid. How you doing today, Rich? I feel like wavy gravy on that harmless tobacco. (laughs) No, I'm feeling good today, man. It's another Mr. Burns episode, so there's nothing to complain about here. It's always a good time. But like you said, we got plenty to get into, so I guess I won't waste any time. That's your job. I'll go ahead and throw it back to you. The man, the myth, the booger man. It's Miles. (laughs) Well, we always talk about how much we love our Potter family on this podcast, and today it is no different. And we have a great guest coming from one of our great Potter family podcasts, We've got Sean from the Writer's Bone joining us today. How you doing today, Sean? Hey guys, thanks for having me. I'm I'm pumped. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm so ready like Burns. I'm ready to shoot at a homeless man on the street. <laughs> as long as you have 20 minutes to reload. Uh, trust me. Dance. Uh, <laughs> I said dance. <laughs> dance. <laughs> Hold on. Uh. So Sean, uh, oh go ahead, Richie. I was going to say, it kind of sounded like you might be doing something else there for a second, Sean. <laughs> and it usually does take, that other thing usually takes me 20 minutes to reload as well. <laughs> wow. It takes me way longer now. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's, it's drugs that help. And it just a lot, a lot of drugs. I know my mother's listening. Hi, mom. I'm glad you paid for all that college. <laughs> We're so glad to have another listener. <laughs> so sean oh she's checked out we always uh start these things off pretty much the same way when we have a new guest mm-hmm. and we always like to hear about not only tell us about yourself and and your podcast but also tell us about your earliest connection to the simpsons but let's be sporting about this sean if you can do this mm-hmm. without using the letter e we'll let you stay and review the episode with us oh no <laughs> uh, i Simp, look, I can barely speak basic English day to day. This is just, I still don't know how to spell. Please don't tell anyone. You, you know, know, this is between the three of us. L- Lenny killed it compared to you. I'm not even going to lie, but please, sir, tell us a little bit about No, he didn't. He said like 50 E's. What He's are you a talking good about? work guy. What are you talking about? <laughs> Me. <laughs> the Simpsons. For me, has always con- has been a constant. It's been that thing that has always been lingering in, in in the background, and it was what I would say was the the Simpsons were the doorway into pop culture. You know, I think like all of us, we were raised on pop culture, and the Simpsons definitely was an introduction to it. And because those early seasons or every season was so filled with pop culture references um, from the past and from current times. It really ended up brought me into learning about other films and TV shows. Uh, so I remember Sunday nights watching the new episodes, and I grew up uh, outside of DC. Fox Five between six and seven would show Simpson reruns, so that's how I really got into it every day, just rewatching them. So they've always been that constant, almost older brother of like, "Hey, you should check this out." I think most movies I learned about were because they'd make a joke about it. My dad would laugh. I would ask him. He said, "Oh, it's from this movie." You, and then I would go look for the movie, watch, and be like, oh, I see what they did. You know, that's a fascinating way you put that. I, we, we, that's a very common thing. People our age tend to have grown up on the reruns, both watching watching mm-hmm. the new one, but then also catching four or five, sometimes more episodes a day because of how syndicated the show is. But you are the first person that I have heard put it in terms of 
The Simpsons is like an older brother, and it's really mm. that that's interesting to me because I'm an only child. And I think in a lot of ways, I never realized just how true that is because a lot of my friends were getting their humor, some of like, you know, the more adult jokes from literally their older siblings. But for me, it was very much the Simpsons kind of opening that door into the adult world, if you will. Definitely. Yeah, it was always I am the older brother. So I I got my humor from the Simpsons, that wackiness, but also pulling from pop culture. You don't realize how often you make jokes to your friends and you pull from a movie or from a TV show. And you kind of get that from The Simpsons because they were doing it left and right. It, it, it's strange to think that guys our age at that time were just like, all right, w- let's see if we can get a, a reference uh, from uh, Citizen Kane and put it in this episode. All right. And they do it. And they do it so well is the other part of that. Mm. It's not just that they're pulling out random references the way they, they kind of weave them into their stories are uh, sometimes I, I straight up miss them even even on these rewatches yes. it's like I'll, I'll be going through notes on the internet and somebody will point something out and i'll be like what the hell are they talking about and then through research i realized like wow that was this really <laughs> subtle layered joke where they were copying the scene from the movie or whatever it might be exactly there's one in the episode and we're going to talk about burns there they pull like a storyline from a movie that now it's escaping my name. It had James Wood and Brian Dennehy from like 1982 or 83 about a reprogrammer, about a family that hires James Wood to go get their son and reprogram it. And that's just a huge joke in the middle of this episode where they do that to Hans moment. A fantastic Spoilers. joke. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fantastic yeah. joke where they, they transform or reprogram Hans Moleman into Bart. My favorite Hans Moleman joke so far. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it is I, a I, good I've got one. some issues with that still, but we'll talk about it. <laughs> uh, oh, no. <laughs> well, things are going to get ugly, I still folks. don't know what race he is. <laughs> He's every race. Mo- uh, Hans Moleman is all of he us. Transcends, you know? He transcends it, was it, race. Was it, was it uh, Split Image or Best Seller? One of those two. Split Image. Yeah, Split Image. Yeah, Peter Fonda's in that, right? I'm not making that up. He's in the movie. It's Peter Fonda, Brian Dennehy, and it's from the director of First Blood, whose name escapes me now. Rambo. Um, <laughs> Rambo, yeah. Yeah, yeah Rambo. Sean Rambo. Rambo. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we could do a whole other podcast on First Blood, but we don't We don't have time for that. I think that's a great film. But we are here to talk Simpsons, man. And this episode, I, I, got, I want to hear what you guys think about this, because you have deep dive information that makes me look... Like a chubby kid without cake. No, we just surround ourselves by smarter people than us, like yourself, and it makes us look really solid. That's the secret to our success. <laughs> That's why there's these lulls Same. in between yep. episodes when we don't have guests. <laughs> and, and Miles still doesn't know what phallocentric means, even after watching this one. <laughs> All I know is it doesn't matter. No girls allowed, damn it. <laughs> that might have been my favorite joke of the episode I don't there's, know. there's a lot of contenders on this one and i'm i'm glad you're excited to talk about the simpsons sean and we're definitely excited to talk about the simpsons but let's not get ahead of ourselves i also want to hear just a little bit about your podcast writer's bone i know that we we can clearly tell the simpsons has at least partially sculpted your sense of humor tell us mm. about how you've taken that to the podcasting world well Writer's Bone has been done with uh, Dan Ford, who's my partner, and uh, it was a podcast that we made because we're both transplants. We both live here in Boston, but you know he's from Connecticut. I'm from Florida, so uh, it was this great way of having an outlet when we didn't have one. We're both artists. He's a, a writer. His book just came out. Uh, Sid Sanford lives. You can go pick it up. There's a nice little plug. Nice. Uh, yeah, just make sure we get that in there. Uh, and that it's kind of started from this frustration if we we had no outlet. And then we kind of realized there's all these other people we can talk to, writers and screenwriters. And it's been this great experience over four years to talk to – we got like a master's class because we've been talking to the best of the best. You know, Dan's talked to uh, – why can't I remember his name right now? The guy who did uh, Nobody's Fool. Oh, I'm I'm blanking. I'm sorry, Dan. <laughs> uh, but I got to, <laughs> I've got to talk to like Scott Frank who – you know, the screenwriter who did Get Shorty, The Lookout, and recently oh, cool. Logan. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, you, we get to sit and talk to these people about their careers and learn stuff. And you kind of learn 
what we've learned over the four years is like everyone might have a different method or be in a different place in their career, but everyone still has that basic need to tell a story. And that's what we hope people learn when they listen to the podcast. We have almost 300 episodes, guys. So at some point, we're going to have an episode you're going to enjoy, I hope. And it's not going to be because of Dan or I. It's going to be because of our guests. I mean, really, I think a monkey can do our job. We tried it for like six months. <laughs> the, the monkey did really well. He uh, – great interviews, handled himself well, eventually killed himself. It was, it was the peak of your was, show in my opinion. I really enjoyed those monkey episodes. <clears throat> They were great, but unfortunately, Mojo couldn't take it and just took his own life. And it's a I'm lot of stress being a podcaster. People that you know—that's the dark underbelly of yeah. this of this gig that people just don't see. Yeah, that you know. Look, there's a lot of drugs. There's a lot of late night partying. Uh, you just you can't handle it. And if you've ever tried to get monkey brain out of your wall, I mean, it is tough, especially in this market, because you want to re- have good resale value. It's honestly just but, easier uh, to start shooting more monkeys and just call it a decoration choice. We're just we're we're putting monkey brain as the style choice now in our house. <laughs> That's what we did, and my girlfriend very quickly stopped that after the third <laughs> monkey. She just opened the back door, and a hundred monkeys ran out, and I was just drenched in blood. And she's like, "Again, no." Did one of the monkeys type out, it was the best of times, it was the blurst of times? <laughs> it did. And then, um, the, actually, the monkey said, you damn dirty ape to me, which I was highly offended by, because I think that had some racial undertones. But I kind of <laughs> let it fly, because <laughs> at that point, the police were coming, and I had just murdered four monkeys. So, uh, I was on the PETA. run for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry, PETA. Have we, there. have we told you about our new sponsors, PETA? <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about They're the like, food, oh. not the not the animal organization. <laughs> that oh, that's even better. Now made with fresh monkey fan. brains. That's right. Mm. Just like Temple of Doom. Wow, just taking yeah. scoops. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I don't know how. I'm not mm, sure something. how this is even possible, but I love that we got here. I really do. <laughs> your your guests are like I, your listeners are like I am so confused and horrified. <laughs> I thought this was what, a Simpsons did, podcast. <laughs> did the Tuppy guy kill a bunch of monkeys? Did he just admit to that? He killed monkeys. Uh, didn't this he? This is gonna be forever. Didn't he? So <laughs> I usually try to come up with a creative segue to get us back on track, but <laughs> fuck that. Speaking of <laughs> monkey brains. <laughs> <laughs> that works. That's as good as we're going to get. We are talking about The Simpsons today, specifically the episode Burns Air, which debuted on April 14th, 1994. This one does have a traditional chalk gag. The Pledge of Allegiance does not end with Hail Satan. That's optional. Freedom of speech, right? You can end it with however you want to end it. (laughs) The couch gag (laughs) on this one uh, shows the Simpsons family all bundled up into little bouncy balls that are bouncing around the living room, but all do eventually land in the correct spot on the couch. And thanks to Maggie back to back weeks in a row, though, arguably this one is definitely a far more minor character. We do get a first appearance of a, very somewhat, I should say, popular, not very popular, a, a popular behind the scenes or side character. It's the debut of the Estonian Dwarf. <laughs> Thank you for that, Miles. And, hey, this was actually, I wasn't even going to bother listing this, but this dwarf has so much like fan dedication. He truly is one of the like more popular side characters that's just reoccurring, but doesn't really have much of a story. Uh, he's just a character that we see appear throughout Springfield multiple times throughout the series. It's it's strange when a minor character like that becomes gets his own fanfare. That shows you the hardcore fandom of The Simpsons. A, a character so small who appears sporadically is enough that people are like, no, I really like him and I want to know what his backstory is. I mean, it's it speaks highly. 30 years worth of these character development. It's like we know so much about the Simpsons clan and even their direct neighbors and best friends that, yeah, it almost makes you want to have these stories from the more obscure parts of town, especially when you have this really interesting bit. I mean, just in this episode, we see this character is dressed like an elf at like a Christmas display of some sort and then is ran over by Homer and then is somehow hired by Monty Burns to play Lisa next to Michael Caine's version of Homer. Like there's a lot that happens to this character in like the 30 to 45 seconds that it is on screen in this one episode so far. And you know what? I'll say this. Michael Caine still speaks highly of that uh, performance, even more than Jaws 4. He thinks it's a better performance. <laughs> but I don't think this one bought him a house like Jaws 4 did. 
<laughs> if if we want to get darker, what if he perfected the role of Lisa after this episode and it's actually been him the entire time? Oh, Lisa died Ooh. in season five. That does seem it makes really sense. Merkin-ish. That does actually yeah. there's a joke in this mo- in this episode where it made me think there's a serial killer in uh Springfield. So she could have been killed by the make believe serial killer that I think they referenced to. So Interesting. I'm going to go with, yeah. I think what happens is Lisa figures out who the serial killer is while the Estonian is running away from the serial killer. And then in like a dramatic effect, Lisa like saves the Estonian's life, but also takes out the serial killer. So to pay her back, the Estonian takes over her life. That's- I'm a hundred percent on board on this movie. I, I want every, yeah. I, let's make I this. want the series let's- to end that way. Now it's going to be on the very last <laughs> shot of the show. All the Simpsons are like, you know, doing their farewell moments. And Lisa just pulls her fucking mask off. Estonian dwarf for the last 25, whatever years it's been. <laughs> Uh, I have stories credits. to tell. <laughs> <laughs> Cigar in mouth credits, boom, over. Everyone slack jawed. And they're, and they're, I, I, and we can do it. I think it's going to get done, yeah. It's got at least <laughs> as much of a chance as Homer does at winning the, in, what is it, it, wins the employee of the week or no. He just wins a random prize yeah. while he's sitting there uh eating a donut at his job complaining all of a sudden the employee and, raffle yeah that's what it was uh, these two people show up with a microphone and a big congl- <laughs> congratulatory sign that says you've just won the employee raffle <laughs> woohoo what do i get the job of industrial chimney sweep <laughs> <laughs> woohoo in standard homer form doesn't understand it still excited about it Ex- they're just telling him he won, and that's all he really cares about. <laughs> it's they do this great thing though, where they make it this big celebration, so they're they're not the wise. There's or... yeah, there's a sign that comes out of nowhere, a host who presents him with the prize, and if I believe there are like uh, like showgirls to the left and right presenting, right, yeah. to, so that means at some point Homer did not notice that there was a worker in his office, like in his cube, setting up the banner, and there's just like two women off to the side smoking cigarettes, leaning against the wall, like looking at their watch, like, all right, well, he has an hour of our time, so you better make it worth it. Come on. Well, I mean, how observant does a safety inspector really need to be, Sean? <laughs> when it's Homer J. Simpson, not very. <laughs> <laughs> like you mentioned, though, Homer's just ecstatic about this, and he, he still even seems happy when he gets to perform said duties, which they literally have him on a crane, he's wearing basically an SOS pad around his body. <laughs> it's just like a big metal scrub brush. And they're actually <sighs> dipping him physically into the smokestacks of the nuclear power plant. Uh, uh, great joke here, too, because he's clearly <laughs> not doing a great job. I mean, like, literally the job he's been assigned is terrible. He's being filled with smoke and he, he's all disgusting. But he thinks to himself... Well, this is tough work, but at least I know the fat cats at the top are also (laughs) working hard. (laughs) I wish I could take a bath on the job. (laughs) Look, I'm going to say this right now. OSHA says it's okay for him to do that. They actually say that's the best way to have uh, those smokestacks cleared. By the way, I love that Homer justifies the horrible job. Like, Like an insane person that he is, he's just like, no, this is this is fine. I'm doing this for the greater good. Which completely under like when you understand Homer Simpson, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. He would do that. He would justify his horrible place in life. <laughs> well, and it just it goes. There's so many questions that are going through your head because they treat this just so normally in a, in a way. I mean, he's talking to himself while dangling from a crane <laughs> over a smokestack, and that's how we are seeing this scene happen. But you don't even really think at first, like, why don't they just have a, a weight? Like, why do they even need a person in this role? Uh, and, and for me, at least, it, it took like two clicks before I was like, wait, this is even dumber <laughs> because of that. Like, also, the fact that <laughs> well, people can wiggle around and get every little spot. That's, so. uh, I guess that's totally worth that's it. That's true. That's I, I'm going to assume that that was the uh, midget job before he worked at the Elf Lot. Like, and that's why they actually set this up because they lost him. He's like, I get better pay at the Christmas land as an elf than I do cleaning this out because he's so small. He can get those hard to reach spots. Because, you know... Well, and then you don't get the black lung either, so there's multiple benefits. That's true, but, you know, midgets have such tiny lungs, it doesn't matter. <laughs> because, you know what, they're going to die soon anyways. Come at me, Peter Dickridge. Come on. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. 
tiny. <laughs> He's an angry little elf. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, wow. <laughs> get ready to be sued, so boys. We please, actually, please don't die in the last season of Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually do see the hardworking people at the top. In this case, it is Mr. Burns taking a bubble bath. Actually, more so he's being given a bubble bath by Smithers. Uh, Smithers actually has to leave the room for a minute, and he sets the sponge down on top of Mr. Burns' head. And I love this sequence because Mr. Burns is essentially accepting his fate of death <laughs> as the weight of the sponge slowly pushes his body under the water. He wears a top hat. Can we just... I've taken While he's I've taken many baths many times. He wears a top hat. The sponge goes on top of the top hat, and that's what pushes him down. He's such a frail man, but you're right. If you're his age, don't you just accept death? Like at this point, I've turned thirty. Every time I cross the street, I'm like, at some point, I'm just gonna die. So I bring it. <laughs> like being when you're you're in like your teenage years, it doesn't even like really register that you might die at any time. And now I'm just like, wow, I've pretty much lived past my deserved years or promised years at this point I'm, every moment is precious at this point i'm like i've outlived pocahontas she died like she was like <laughs> 20 and she gave birth went to the like left the new world to england according to disney and had a pretty good life so like she's dead already like i have done nothing like she has so ugh. <laughs> see i i think burns hasn't realized this though i think that's that's his character flaw if you so to speak because a character like grandpa grandpa i totally buy into that aspect but Burns, I mean, he's either that sponge has corners, you know, <laughs> like he's taking. Every oh, precaution. let me go get a round one, sir. <laughs> he's taking every precaution to stay out of death's way, and he's he's weak a lot of times. But there's times where he's super limber as well. So I think he's doing everything he can to avoid that topic. He's more scared of it, whereas Grandpa's accepted death as like it's going to happen, Mister Burns. Like he said, the sponge has squares on it. That he knows he's rigged the game so he can live as long as he can. That's why he takes his radiation treatment every Friday. <laughs> and a Abe is so comfortable with death at this point, he can literally have a heart attack, go down for the count, and then just decide, ah, I'm okay. <laughs> and I'm back. <laughs> but for now, we actually see Mr. Burns' life flash before his eyes. He, we go back to when he was a baby. He had his nanny feeding him a bottle, but uh, he basically uh, swats it away and fires her as an infant, which is, is great. <laughs> As a young man, we see the scene we were referencing earlier where Mr. Burns has to very slowly reload, I believe, a musket pistol, a musket style pistol, and he's shooting at a man's feet saying dance, but it takes him a good 20 set plus seconds in between each reload. And they stick with the reload. and Which is still quick. Yeah, for the time. I mean, he was a young, limber man at that time, but also the <laughs> home, the vagrant stays he's like i get uh, he has to be paying him this is mr burns sense of fun was like i'm gonna pay a homeless man to dance for me while i shoot at him <laughs> the third one they do is actually my favorite and that's where we see mr burns is on a ship with two other men that kind of look like hippies to some extent and mr burns is disguised <laughs> as a hippie but he is holding a ball and he's piece. pulling off his it, it is green <laughs> piece, thank you uh, what do they actually say? All right, we're finally going to stop those corporate pigs from dumping that nuclear waste. And another man realizes, oh no, our boat's sinking. It was I, you fools. The man you trusted wasn't wavy gravy at all. And all this time, I've been smoking harmless tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where you see him with that bong stripping away his fake facial hair and basically his hippie attire. Uh, first of all, disgusting. Ew, smoking tobacco out of a bong would be like the worst thing ever like i, I can't <laughs> imagine a worse punishment quite frankly <laughs> too legit to quit also wouldn't the greenpeace people know it's like there's a different scent between marijuana and tobacco wouldn't at some point someone go it smells like menthols in here <laughs> yeah that's a really accurate point though i guess they might be too stoned to realize or just happy that they don't have to share their weed <laughs> they are cheap they are <laughs> i just i just like his name wavy gravy is a great name <laughs> well and just in case there's anybody wondering, Wavy Gravy is, in fact, a real-life American activist. He was uh, very much a hippie uh, back in the 60s. He was born in the 1930s, so he was really, you know, at that age to both be old enough to care and, you know, I guess to some degree uh, passionate enough to do something about it. But he, he did some music as well, but mostly he was just known 
for his uh, out there style. He, uh, you know, often would wear the tie dyes, silly hats. Even the picture they have of him on uh, Wikipedia shows him wearing a cowboy hat and a clown nose. <laughs> so uh, a character, we'll say. But that is, in fact, a real life American activist that that joke was referencing. How and again, like we said in the beginning of the episode, the Simpsons go again, going for a deep dive layer joke that. 99% of the people won't get except that one and they they fit it in there and it made it so much better oh I just happened to re- uh, that's a really valid point and yes you're right it's exactly what we were talking about at the top of the show but I just saw here as well he got his name it was given to him by B.B. King Whoa. Uh, during the Texas International Whoa. Pop Festival in 1969 so did you that's say a, Texas? that's pretty cool I did I did that's a pretty cool little story though to be monikered by B.B. King I think that's a pretty dope accomplishment in itself is wavy gravy an actual product not a person but is there gravy that is wavy because life over man I'll eat it and honestly, if it's not being sold in a tie-dye colored can or jar at the store right now, people are missing out on an opportunity. But it also makes the joke a lot better because it's somebody that was obviously beloved in, with, within the community, within their <laughs> group especially. So the fact that Mr. Burns was actually this person, like in real life it was Mr. Burns, let's be honest. <laughs> so the fact that it was just him the whole time in his charade, that makes it even funnier. <laughs> That is pretty funny. <laughs> did Wavy DV did did he die at sea? Was that by the way, the Greenpeace boat is so cheap that t- he literally just puts one hole in it and it starts going down goes, with like a corkscrew. <laughs> yeah, like he's using like a bottle opener, basically. <laughs> How cheap is their ship? I've been on a few boats and I'm like, all right, corkscrew won't bring this down. But in this in the Simpsons universe, any you know any giant object can be taken down very easily. Uh, this was a quarter-sized hole at best. <laughs> but what did he put in the hole? Oh, valid point. That's true. He, he might have packed it with some of that tobacco. I don't know. Maybe it absorbed more water and quicker. His uranium corkscrew. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we can assume that those Greenpeace activists died at sea, right? Like they either had hypothermia or they were eaten. Well, they didn't have an inflatable vest that they were wearing as a disguise this entire time. I love that, too. As Burns jumps overboard, he just pulls a string on his vest and he he inflates and floats away i imagine they they just like calmly got off the boat and made it back perfectly fine they're like eh, what else can we do <laughs> oh they all forgot they're like was our ship just taken down yeah who cares was that a dream man? <laughs> yeah who cares let's load up another bowl <laughs> let's get high let's get high let's try that tobacco thing <laughs> <laughs> sounds <laughs> sounds safe <laughs> totally harmless <laughs> Not like those deadly, deadly bathtubs that Mr. Smithers returns to see Burns drowning in. (laughs) He immediately grabs him and pulls him to safety, but Burns is pissed. He yells out, you almost killed me, and starts to strangle him. I love that uh, instead, though, of Smithers, you know, defending himself in any way, he just tries to wrap him up in a towel. (laughs) After all, he doesn't want Mr. Burns to catch a cold. (laughs) Also, Mr. Burns is too weak to take a sponge off his head, but he's incredibly strong enough to choke Smithers. (laughs) And he could also, (laughs) Smithers yells, why do the young, why do the good always die young as he grips a corpse? (laughs) I forgot about that. You're totally right. (laughs) (laughs) Oh. This near-death experience gives Mr. Burns a epiphany. He realizes that if he were to have died there, he would have nobody to leave his fortune to. <laughs> Smithers is great here again. He just kind of... <clears throat> well, due, due to his corner. hectic schedule and his lethargic sperm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, Burns goes on to tell Mr. Smithers that he's got other plans for him and... He not only has the idea, he's made up a model of it. He goes to what is essentially a scale model of his uh, mausoleum where he's (laughs) going to be buried. And he pulls out his own casket where we see a dead Mr. Burns with a crumpled up Smithers who looks absolutely terrified at his (laughs) feet. I just love the idea that they actually took the time to put this look of terror on the model of Mr. Smithers. Yeah, they, the look he's giving is like he's clawing to get out of there. And it's just the, the moment that Burns was thinking, you know what? I, one day I'm going to have to show my idea. And if I describe it, it won't punch as hard. Hey, Debbie in accounting, do we have enough money so I can go make a screaming Smithers to fit in this coffin? <laughs> 
Well, and like, who do you contact whenever it comes back and the 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 the, the model just looks normal or plain or not worried? And they're like, no, I said it needs to be terrified, damn it. <laughs> Burn. See, I, I picture a universe where Burns actually made Smithers make the pieces individually. <laughs> and Smithers thinks it's going to be some like great gift at one point. And then when he finally reveals it, he's like, no, what have I done? <laughs> I, wor- I worked on Saturday night to get that made on time. It looks so good. <laughs> <laughs> but the show to the Simpsons where it's like they were willing to put in that tiny joke the writers were like you know that they were sitting around the table going oh we have to have this sight joke in there and it's only going to be two seconds but it's totally worth it <laughs> and it was such a good one too yeah you're absolutely <laughs> right that uh just again, I just I, I can't help but giggle like every time I just think about the face on this little <laughs> model dummy of Smithers. It gets me every single time. <laughs> but he has to bury him alive. <laughs> and and then Burns is presenting this as if it's like some sort of special honor. Like he's like, no, no, Smithers, I've got something very he special like planned for you. Yeah. Kind of like when a dog brings you like a dead bird. They're like, this is for you. And you're like, oh, God, what have you done? And they look so proud. Like, aren't you so happy? Look what I what look what I brought you. Bert is like, you're so welcome. Aren't you ready to face immortality? Time to get the old yellow rifle. <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of old yeller, we meet up with the Simpsons family at the movie theater where they're actually playing Siskel and Ebert the movie. Which is <laughs> why are we speaking about old yeller? Because <laughs> it's a movie. I was trying to segue. Uh, <laughs> So Siskel and Ebert, the movie, is actually given two thumbs up by Siskel and Ebert, of course. I love that part. The next sequence shows a bunch of the Springfield citizens sitting in a movie theater, and you get one of those THX sound check things they do that makes the really loud, like, (laughs) sound that, you know, always amps up the bass in the theater and I guess lets people know how much the sound impacts the film. In this case, it actually starts impacting the the residents in the ways that like their glasses start shattering, their teeth start exploding, and even one person's head actually explodes during the sequence. But of course, one man in the back is yelling, <laughs> "Turn it up! Turn it up!" <laughs> Abe Simpson still right. can't hear. <laughs> but and and here's my issue that I was alluding to earlier about Hans Molman. He looked. Black, again, in the last episode of The Simpsons, when they're in the retirement castle. And in this one, he's clearly yellow in the audience. Now, later in this episode, when he's coming out of a hotel room, he's not going to look yellow anymore. And then at the end of the episode, he will. And I think by the end of this episode, maybe they've kindly... Kindly? (laughs) I think by the end of this episode, maybe they've finally gotten him down, and they'll go forward with that at that point. But they flip-flop his nationality all the time which maybe means there are a league of mole man somewhere and there's different ones we're seeing this does kind of support that mole man is a race of like creatures conspiracy just and homer keeps thwarting him <laughs> they're always planning to take over but it's homer j simpson who gets in the way by the way the thx joke is hilarious i i didn't do the research that i should have but i did read that actual thx love the joke so much that they actually did use it as an advertisement at one point. If that's true, I don't know, but I hope it is. No, that is absolutely true. That was the interesting thing I was going to bring up. It, it is pretty, uh, it, it very much like you just said, it happened. But specifically, it was George Lucas who saw this and really loved it. And that is, he was uh, with <laughs> Industrial Lights and Magic at the time. He called up the creators of The Simpsons and arranged that this became one of the actual audio sound tests that they used in movie theaters for about three years in the mid nineties. Uh, they essentially recreated this scene almost exactly, but they, they had to do some changes to make it fit on the big screen. But ultimately they copied this gag to actually be used in theaters. And it played, like I said, for about three years during the nineties. And again, it all started with a phone call from George Lucas himself, because he saw that scene and thought it was hilarious and wanted to put something together for it. He was actually on a Tauntaun when he made the phone call. It, it's strange, but he actually has a, a warehouse full of actual living Tauntauns. <laughs> but he has to uh, uh, crawl out. Yeah, they can't. He can't be inside them because the reception's terrible. Yeah, he he has tried that, and then back in the nineties, man, cell phones did not get great reception while inside the carcass of a uh, recently killed Tauntaun. 
And they were as big as a house they were. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you're on a premium network, you can still get coverage. But yeah, in, in those times, this it wasn't going to happen for you. No, unfortunately. And I mean, George worked really hard for that. By the way, I do like the fact that George Lucas, a man who has shaped pop culture, watches pop culture. Because in my mind, I figure he's just in an office somewhere crying over a model of Jar Jar Binks thinking like, you were supposed to be the one. <laughs> But you were supposed to be the best one. <laughs> <laughs> you racist son of a bitch. And he's just petting it. <laughs> but it's funny to think that he is part like that shows you the reach of the Simpsons, especially at this era, 1994, when they were really picking up that he was willing. He just sat and watched an episode. Yeah, exactly. Because it, it was new enough that he wasn't catching this in reruns. He was actually watching the show. It is awesome. Makes it that much cooler. Absolutely. <laughs> and I remember being in theaters. Money. This was probably around the same time that, you know, they would play this and then Bart would try to sell you some Butterfinger BBs on the big screen because there was like this big collaboration with the Simpsons <coughs> and movie theaters during this time. It, by the way, the movie that came out when this episode premiered, No Escape with Ray Liotta. Just, just a little fact in there. You're not missing much by not seeing the film, but more than likely... Bart would try to sell you BBs, great commercial, and then you would have watched Ray Liotta <laughs> in a post-apocalyptic future film that made you want to kill yourself. And then you'd be like, I'm going to go home and watch The Simpsons. Yeah. There is an escape plan. <laughs> <laughs> that was on the poster. Much better. <laughs> so instead of seeing previews for films at this movie theater, we actually see Mr. Burns pop up on the large screen. He's in a field. And he introduces himself. Homer immediately gets scared when he sees his boss on the big screen, but it's okay. He has a little announcement for the audience. Now then, I'm looking for a suitable young male heir to leave my fortune to when I pass away. My vast, vast, vast fortune. Vast. (laughs) (laughs) Auditions will be tomorrow at my estate. And now, our feature presentation. (laughs) Oh, very well. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Get ourselves some snacks. (laughs) Which, by the way, I loved Burns' rendition of that a lot more than the actual commercial. (laughs) Agreed. The fact that he's in a a field of roses and he's wearing... um, Robin Williams' outfit from the movie Toys makes it so much better. Yes, that was they. They talked about that very briefly on the commentary. A uh, m- movie that absolutely flops during Robin Williams, and part of the reasoning it flopped or the suspicion of its flopping was that it had a very, very unusual trailer that basically this is spoofing. <laughs> uh, really, really deep, dark. Like I, I think this one was probably maybe a little bit more noticeable at the time mm-hmm. because toys would have been on everybody's mind. But this is one of those very obscure jokes that you actually have to like look up to figure out at this point because if you if you are not familiar with that movie, you would have no idea what this was this was referencing. It's true. I didn't get it the first time and uh, it was actually because my partner Dan for some reason recently brought the film up to me and it kind of connected i think the fourth or fifth time i watched the episode like oh okay i get it now that's funny i I, you know i saw that movie when i was a kid thinking you know oh yeah basically i thought it was gonna be toy story and it definitely was not it it was not (laughs) it was terrifying i remember watching that movie being scared because i didn't understand what was going on it was on show it wasn't like the like they were like militarizing toys in a toy factory or something crazy. I don't know. It was nuts. It was. It, it's Barry Levinson's like dream project. He waited like ten years to make it. Like this is what I'm going to do. He got Robin Williams and he made it. I haven't seen the movie since, but it made no sense to me as a child. And I pretty much, it's a pretty simple plot. It made no sense, and I remember being terrified. So go watch Toys, everybody. See if you can get it on Laserdisc. <laughs> so Tony Stark before Tony Stark, but really after Tony Stark. <laughs> what if Marvel does a crossover? I think he's slated to be in the fourth <laughs> Avengers movie. Yeah, <laughs> that was it. That was that was the plan. They're like Phase Four. We're going to introduce and Robin Williams in, in, from Toys, and him and Stark are going to be in the next movie. And then they got the phone call. It's like, oh, he's dead. Ah, 
They're just gonna do it with hologram now. That's that's the next step. <laughs> oh, oh. Especially with uh, especially with what's happening to everybody in Hollywood currently, they're just gonna get rid of all the people that you know have basically been uh, exposed as being a terrible human being, and they're just gonna have holograms replace all the actors. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the next that's the next step it sucks but it is what it is you know what? same with concerts yeah that's fine if that's the only way i get to see princess in a 3d in a hologram form i'll take it yeah the velveteen dream i'd love to see him as well <laughs> oh god still sexually appealing as a hologram i'd, I'd hit it <laughs> oh right on speaking of sexually appealing <laughs> i agree let's move on <laughs> So the next night, we were actually at the Burns Estate. Uh, Richie, do you have the sign that's on the, the door there? I don't think I do, actually. Your book usually has it. I didn't yeah. write it down. Well, Wait, there's is it a the, uh, Conformco Brain Deprogrammers? Nope, that's, that's, that's the next that's one. That's the other one, This yeah, one yeah, is yeah. basically something to do with... Uh, it had a reference to Lily Langtree, who I had to look up, and essentially it was like in honor of her, everyone else could go to hell, is what the sign said. Uh, Lily Langtree is was born in the 1800s. She was a well-known socialite, born in New Jersey, ended up marrying a British guy and moving to London. Uh, and again, I think the reference here is that Burns is just so old that he would actually had been rubbing elbows with a socialite from the late 1800s and honoring her with this wing of his mansion. <laughs> or it's foreshadowing that Bart's going to be the one that wins because it is one of his catchphrases too. Ah, okay. That mm. good, good point there. That is a again another deep dive for a joke that if you're not paying attention, you would never get it. That's that's all just for the writers. Yeah, that exactly. It's like they might tell their friends like, "Oh, during this scene, make sure you read this sign, and it'll totally make you, you know, LOL or whatever." <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that 1800s, Miles. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. <laughs> hey, you know what? Just like Millhouse, my mom thinks I'm cool, all right? And that's what we see actually next. I forgot this line was in this episode, but such a classic Millhouse line. He's the first one we see auditioning, and he straight up tells Burns, I have nothing to offer you but my love. <laughs> I specifically said no geeks, <laughs> but my mom says I'm cool. And he says it with his chin down, and little pudgy <laughs> stomach out because he's stuffed into a tux that's too small for him. <laughs> next. <laughs> and next up is actually Nelson, who basically goes with the opposite approach. He just straight out says to Burns, give me your fortune or I'll pound your withered old face in. Oh, I like his energy. Put him on the callback list. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, we see Martin come out. And of course, Martin goes all out like he always does with clang, clang, clang with the trolley. <laughs> ring, ring, ring with the bell. Zing, zing, zing with my heartstrings. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> and Nelson comes out and punches him in the stomach. Burns again is absolutely brilliant here. <laughs> Thank you. Give the bully an extra point. <laughs> they're on a point system with the children. They're, they're judging those kids on points. This is basically America's Got Talent before there was America. Springfield's Got Talent is what we're looking at right here. <laughs> There's a great moment before that where you see all the parents primping the children as they're about to go on stage. Like you see Wiggums and uh, Ralph and he's just telling him what to say. And it's this great moment where you realize all of Springfield – has brought their children out to just be present. Like they're whoring their children out for Mr. Burns. It's such a great moment of like, Oh God, they're so depraved. They're all looking at their kids as a get rich quick scheme. Basically <laughs> every single one of them, including the two attempts by the Simpsons family. Cause we actually see Lisa walk out on stage. <clears throat> I proposed to you that your heir not need be a boy. And this phallocentric society of ours... Uh, I don't know what phallocentric means, but no girls. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good joke. Well, and it's cherried on top here because we see Milhouse backstage putting on a dress and a wig. And he says, so much for plan B. <laughs> <laughs> Whose plan B was that? Or Milhouse. Was it Milhouse's plan B or was his parents like... Well, I don't think his dad would have such uh, an idea with no dignity in it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I, I think it was totally Milhouse's idea. And when he started getting dressed, his <laughs> mother was like, Milhouse, what are you doing? He's like, let him do it, ton. 
Do they just roll with it after that? So <laughs> to let them do it. Good for yeah, them. Yeah, you know what? They're accepting. They're a very accepting family. Progressive parents. I, I like. He that. tried to borrow Simpsons, a feeling from Simpsons his son. Are, are leading the trend. <laughs> <laughs> That's a feeling I haven't felt before. <laughs> Go oh. ahead, laugh. <laughs> I already did. <laughs> so Homer realizes that Lisa's out, and now they've only got one shot left, and it's Bart's. But Bart really doesn't want to be here. I mean, he did start a fire this morning that he should probably be keeping an eye on. <laughs> one of the one of the best side jokes in the whole whole episode. She's like, I should be keeping an eye on that. Okay, kids, if you are listening to this right now and you need to get out of class for a reason, this is a far superior reason than anything else you've come up with. (laughs) If you just tell somebody, hey, I started a fire, it needs to be tended to, I'm pretty sure they're going to let you go. I mean, there's a lot of repercussions if they don't. You need to to say that you started a fire outside of the school. (laughs) Yeah, because if it's on school, that's just going to screw up the whole day. Because at that point, your teacher who's pouring... Uh, booze into her coffee from a flash will just be like fine because you know that's the state of our education she's like whatever just well she won't want the flames to get too close to her coffee or it'll all go up and <laughs> even more flames but it would light her cigarette <laughs> I, I, I think this episode doesn't have Miss Krabappel but has she given up smoking in, in later seasons I forget I think she gives it up Honestly, I, so I don't was, remember that I episode. Honestly I just, don't the know. The last I remember is her marrying Ned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's silence after that, by the way. I've stumped the two <laughs> the Simpson trivia masters. Well, fine. <laughs> Podcast over. <laughs> <laughs> A single gunshot. See if we ever invite you again. <laughs> I'm just going to go back to fantasizing about Steve Austin and the yeah. majors. <laughs> <laughs> As which, which is exactly what Marge is actually doing. First, though, to be fair, she sees an image of her son walking across the stage at Harvard, getting his degree. And of course, Harvard is the most expensive and therefore the best school. <laughs> and then that's the kind of, she's a mom first, a lady second. So, of course, her children come first. And then she fantasizes about having Lee Majors dressed as a Steve Austin <laughs> character from the Six Million Dollar Man. Take her away. Sound effect and all. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's macho. Hell yeah, is what I meant to say. <laughs> Bionically into the air. Oh, like hell that, yeah. Like that phrasing. <laughs> and she realizes that she should probably stop fantasizing about Stone Cold, but then she decides, eh, one more. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings to what was she fantasizing? Because in this case, there's nothing about Bart. So in this, she's probably at home doing the dishes. Steve, Steve Austin comes and takes her away. He probably has a large pizza with extra sausage. (laughs) It was the 90s, after all. It was. (laughs) So, Homer's got a plan, though, that isn't have anything to do with fantasizing about the $6 million man. Homer has written down exactly what Bart needs to say so that he can have the best chance of success. And in a episode full of contenders... This might be my favorite joke in the entire thing. He says, okay, boy, I wrote down exactly what to say. Just read it and you're a shoo in <laughs> And we see Bart walk out on stage with the, his cue cards in hand. Hello, Mr. Kearns. I bad want money now. Me sick. Ooh, he card reads good. <laughs> so pick me, please, Mr. Burns. <laughs> It's Kern. <laughs> so, no, it's it's not. Kern, stupid. <laughs> I can't, no, it's not. Just makes it so much. Because finally, March steps in to be like, no, it's not. Disregard. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, though, the ooh, he card reads good. Like, I just, I had to pause the first time I was watching because I couldn't stop giggling after I heard this line. And I might have that effect right now, <laughs> actually. <laughs> <laughs> he says it with such like sureness of like no i'm confident this is how you say it and honestly the only line in this episode that even has a chance of beating that one is the immediate one that follows it because we see that the kids are upset and marge notices so she wants homer to to talk to him and console them a little bit and when marge asks if there's something he'd like to say he says there sure is kids you tried your best and you failed miserably 
The lesson is never try. <laughs> <laughs> but we forgot bef- before this, Mr. Burns kicked Bart off stage <laughs> with this very elaborate <laughs> oh, crank, yeah. boot on a crank system. Which requires two different cranks to operate, by the way. <laughs> and Bart stands uh, there. He watches as he, again, showing you that <laughs> Mr. Burns has some power for such an old man, turns huge, like six foot high wheels on his own. But what I want to suggest is that this is not the first time a boot to the butt of Bart is going to be brought up. And I think that maybe while Homer's laughing this time, when it comes up in Australia, Homer's like, no, I've seen this happen to my boy once. I'm not going to let it happen again. (laughs) Maybe he actually is a good father. (laughs) Hey, according to our demographic numbers on uh, Podbean, Australia is now the number two largest audience after the United States. So shout out to all of our Australian listeners. It only took a whole continent to get number two. <laughs> <laughs> also, most of those are kangaroos. We can all just admit to it. They're, they're the ones who listen. Yeah, hey, you know what? We're big in the koala world, too. Okay, <laughs> those, those fucking little teddy bears love us. <laughs> As they're strapped to the bottom okay. of a helicopter. You know, it's funny. I, since we're just side tangenting all over the place. Fucking koala bears are, like, widespread with chlamydia. Like, they spread it left and right to each other. Uh, This is absolutely the truth. Like, this is fascinating, but it's one of those nature documentary (laughs) things. But, yeah, there is, like, a rampant run of chlamydia in the koala world, and it's actually one of the reasons you have to be careful handling them. Uh, You know, they're, they're not supposed to just, you know, handle wild animals in general, but specifically... There are warnings, apparently, against handling koalas because of the chlamydia that they have uh, that's just completely overtaken their numbers. <laughs> I didn't know. And is going to be Richie's firstborn daughter. <laughs> oh, gee. Oh, ouch. All right. Well, <laughs> I hope I never have a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and that's your random Australia fact for the day, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Take that, Australia. There you go. <laughs> Don't shred on us. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there goes our audience. <laughs> they were, <laughs> and we just lost one. They were out with the yeah, monkeys. They were great, a yeah. great number two. Why they lasted, yes. <laughs> Monkey murders out tape, but how dare you smirch the name of koala bears? <laughs> Chlamydia koala. <laughs> <laughs> I probably got the wrong STD is the worst part, because I'm only it's briefly like, remembering that. But I it's think it's right. happiness. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Happiness, chlamydia, what's the difference? <laughs> what's the difference? I really like to know what's on your Tinder profile. Why don't you join and find out? <laughs> I'm not paying for premium. <laughs> okay, well, we're almost to the end of our first act, and then you guys can take a break and swipe each other all you want. For now, we see Burns in his office. He's a little bit dejected. He decides that he's never going to find anybody to give his money to, so he's just going to end up having to give it to the Egg Advisory Council. (laughs) I mean, eggs have gotten a really bad rap, you know. (laughs) And then a baby bird that's been petrified flew through the window and crashed on Mr. Burns' floor. (laughs) Oh, look, a bird has become petrified and lost its sense of direction. I think it's a rock, sir. We'll see what the lad has to say about that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's the fact that he has a lab ready for it. <laughs> oh. And then we see uh, Mr. Burns look out his window and see that it's in fact just Bart throwing rocks. And I actually love this little gag he does. I mean, I guess it's more than a gag. It's played as a prank, but it's actually pretty much his property destruction. He runs Mr. Burns' water hose so that it loops around the necks of a lot of his statues. And then when he turns the water on full blast, it actually decapitates all three statues at once, which, of course, we know Bart has some prior experience cutting the heads off of statues. Mm. So I guess he's just gotten really good at it. <laughs> and he fills Burns' car up with water. Quickly. It, he <laughs> takes off the sign from the no soliciting sign. No solicitors. That's the best. <laughs> <laughs> and then all the solicitors come crashing to the front door <laughs> as a big mob of people. They've just been waiting patiently for their moment. <laughs> <laughs> And we cut to the end of the scenes with a quick interaction with Mr. Burns. <laughs> Look, Smithers, a creature of pure malevolence. He's the perfect one to suckle at my proverbial teats. You there, boy! What day is this? Today? Sir? Why, it's Rusev Day! 
I don't know what you're doing there. Is that a wrestling thing? <laughs> I'm not going to say the line until you do it right. <laughs> Tension bit mounts. <laughs> no, I checked the calendar. It's right. It's Rusev Day. Go ahead. Huh? <laughs> you got off a of line. I know. I was going to let you take it. <laughs> since, you're, since you're just making it up as you go, I'm just going to let you take all the lines then. Wrestling jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, why it's Christmas Day. Oh. <laughs> Wow, I didn't ex- expect you to actually cave there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought my threats were empty threats. I was just going to cut it in post. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking us along. to him. You, what day is this? Huh? I'll tell you what day this is. Today is the day you become my heir. And we see Bart throw one last rock that smacks right into Smithers' head. Ooh, I like him a lot. (laughs) And that brings us to the end of our first act. We are going to take a quick break and hear from our Pottern family. Actually, everyone, instead of taking a break, we are going to have to call this episode right here. This conversation with Sean from the Writer's Bone podcast went on a little bit long, but we have a lot more very interesting stuff to talk about in the second and third act of Burns Air. So come back next week for the conclusion of our review of Burns Air. Make sure in the meantime you go and check out the Writer's Bone podcast and you can follow Sean online at S-E-A-N-T-U-O-H-Y-2. You can also follow Richie the Wiz Kid at the Wiz underscore Kid 23 and I am Mr. Most Days Off. Our show, of course, is at Best Darn Diddly. That's going to work pretty much everywhere. Also, want to remind everyone, we are running the contest Worst Contest Ever right now. All you have to do is use the hashtag Worst Contest Ever, and we're going to put you in a drawing to win an early release copy of Mike Reese's new book, Springfield Confidential. So use that hashtag as much as possible. Help us get that trending, and we will hopefully be sending you a book here very soon. Other than that, thank you so much for joining us this week on the Best Darn Diddly Review Show. We love so much that you are along for the ride with this journey with us, and we appreciate you tuning in each and every week. The Wiz Kid and I and Sean from the Writer's Bone Podcast will be back with you again next week for the conclusion of Burns Air. And until next time, be cromulent to each other. I'm Jay. I'm Bob. And I'm Corey. We are the Cretans Guild. We're a trio of man-children whose friendship predates the Lion King, Green Day's Dookie, the N64, and the Chunnel. We have backgrounds working in television, video games, radio broadcasting, creative writing, and pizza delivery. That's a large cheese, right? On our podcast, Nerd or Not, you'll hear us talk about board games, TV, movies, comics, collectibles, video games, wrestling, theme parks. We even did a segment on pizza. So check and listen to us on Podbean, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube. And check out our socials on Twitter and Instagram under Cretans Guild. Welcome to the Guild.